where we've got some other people joining us. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Castelny, and it's my great honor to welcome you here to Preservation Virginia's webinar, Archaeology, Social Relevance, and Community Engagement. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that across Virginia, we inhabit land of indigenous people, people who lived here for generations and whose stories and places were erased by policies and practices that removed their histories from the mainstream narratives. And at the same time, we acknowledge the enslaved African people and their descendants, whose labor was exploited to help establish the economy of Virginia and the United States. These histories have been kept alive in descendant communities, and for that we are grateful. Now priority is being given through storytelling and study to raise awareness of this marginalized history and to expand the narrative and tell a more comprehensive story of historic sites and cultural landscapes. Today, our panelists will explore how engaging different perspectives and voices enhances our ability to bring relevance, diversity, and equity to this history and these historic places. I wanna thank our valued partners at the Department of Historic Resources for their support of this webinar series and express Preservation Virginia's appreciation to our panelists for their time and effort in preparing for today's session. Now, before I introduce our moderator, as always, there are a few housekeeping points. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, Preservation Virginia has offered a series of webinars and educational programming. Um, today's recording and uh, past webinars are available on our website, and I hope you'll um, take a look at them and review them. There really is some great programming um, there. We're going to hold questions to the end of our session, but you can ask your question at any point during um, our conversation. Um, you can do that by going to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And if you'd like to talk to your fellow participants while we're, um, if you have a, uh, if you want to applaud a great point or uh, just share some information, please use the chat section for that. And finally, I want to thank all of you have, who have contributed to Preservation Virginia during these last 20 months. I don't think any of us ever foresaw that we would live through a pandemic. Nonprofits have had a, a particularly challenging time during this period, and we appreciate your support. It's helped us produce programming, support local advocacy, and share history at our historic sites. So thank you. It's now a great honor to introduce Tim Roberts. An archeologist by training, he's conducted investigations in the Southeast, Mid-Atlantic and Midwest United States. He previously worked with the National Park Service Southeast Archeological Center, where he shifted his focus to the history of archeology span of African-Americans. In July, we were so thrilled that he transitioned to a new role as the Community Outreach Coordinator at the Department of Historic Resources to focus on meaningful engagement with African-Americans and Virginia Indians, and with fo a special focus on identifying and recording historic resources si significant to those constituencies. Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, on behalf of the Department of Historic Resources, it's my honor to serve as your moderator today. Um, DHR has introduced a new community outreach program that I'm coordinating, um, which is building on our community services division and the regular public engagement of our state archaeology program. We've also added a cemetery archaeologist to the team whose role is very much engaged with the public. Um, our website has a lot to offer, shameless plug. Uh, our social media traffic has picked up and we've recently released a new Places Explorer app. Um, but despite this growth, a lot of uh, our work at DHR does not have a public facing component. And that's all the more reason we're so excited to partner with uh, Preservation Virginia for events just like this. This afternoon, we're honored to welcome our highly respected panelists whom I'll introduce momentarily, although I expect most of you are familiar with them. Um, you can read their short biographical statements in the chat um, shortly. Um, I'll just remind everyone, as Elizabeth said, the chat window is available for attendees to communicate with each other. Um, and we ask that you type your questions for the panelists um, in the Q&A section. 
Um, we'll ask panelists to respond to the questions at the end of the presentations and responses to questions that we don't get to in the final chapter of this conversation. Um, we're gonna to try to send responses to the email addresses you provided with your registration. Uh, I think the amazing registration turnout for this event already speaks to the relevance of the topic. And I'm an indefatigable optimist, and I'm going to assume we're all collaborators, passionately committed to meaningful engagement, meaningful engagement with each other, our partners, our stakeholders, maybe our nemeses, um, and eager to learn from the experiences of, of our expert panelists. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. Um, the recording, as Elizabeth said, will be accessible through Preservation Virginia's website and YouTube channel. So without further ado, please uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Chief Ann Richardson, Chief of the Rappahannock Tribe, which has been federally recognized since 2019, is the first woman to lead a tribe in Virginia since the 18th century. The Rappahannocks are currently engaged in a number of cultural, educational, social, and economic development initiatives, including their Return to the River Project, which is a youth leadership program. St. Mary's College of Maryland professor, Dr. Julia A. King, teaches, researches, and writes about Chesapeake history in an Atlantic world. She served as president of SHA and on the ACHP. She's received numerous awards for her celebrated work over the past 30 years, uh, which has been widely supported by federal and state agencies and public and private institutions alike. Dr. Kelly Fanta Dietz is a historian and archeologist, critically acclaimed author and chef. Among her many roles, Dr. Dietz is now the director of education and historic interpretation at Virginia's executive mansion. Her work crosses the boundaries of African diaspora studies, archeology, span history and museum studies um, in order to shed light onto the history and legacy of enslaved Africans and African-Americans in Virginia. For the past 21 years, Dr. Matthew Reeves has served as director of archeology span at James Madison's Montpelier in Orange, Virginia. In this time, he's been a champion of community-based research, focusing especially on investing descendant communities in the research and interpretation process and governance of cultural institutions. Last but not least, Dr. Iris uh, uh, Carter Ford, Professor Emerita at St. Mary's College of Maryland, Public Honors College at Historic St. Mary's City. Among her many honored hats, Dr. Ford serves on the board of Montpelier Descendants Com Committee, which shares equal co-stewardship authority with the Montpelier Foundation over the museum and estate of James Madison, a new relationship that is emerging as a model for descendant collaboration. Unfortunately, Dr. Ford can't be with us today, but she did provide uh, a statement, um, which I'll read presently. An unanticipated medical event has put a period to my much anticipated engagement with you today. As vice chair of the Montpelier Descendants Committee, I was so excited to share my story with you. Fortunately, Matt Reeves can represent me like no other. We have worked together for many years. He's a ride or die accomplice reaching well beyond allyship to action and a willingness to risk everything personally and professionally in service to social justice. Even though, even so, I regret that I am unable to meet and engage with the Preservation Virginia community. And although I will not be able to add my voice in real time, it is embedded in Matt's research, public programs, presentations, and in his heart as an activist, anti-racist archeologist. Know that I am in solidarity with your efforts to make archeology span more accessible, more relevant, and I wish you the best. Well, in absentia, we'll thank you, Dr. Ford. And without any further ado, I will welcome to the microphone our first panelist, Dr. Kelly Pantadietz. Thank you so much. And I wanna give a special thanks to Preservation Virginia. Uh, when I was a wee tad youngin, um, they were my first paid, that was my first paid job in archeology span was working at Jamestown with Bly Straub in the lab, um, touching those artifacts and actually getting paid to do it. So I spent the last 20 something years working on African-American history, working uh, tirelessly to bring forth the story of the enslaved African and African Americans who were brought to this colony originally and who have labored for not just the wealth of the old Virginians that used to be here, but for the nation itself. And so I'm gonna share my screen. I've got some slides here. Um, so let me just do this really fast. All right, let me move my little guy. All right, so um, as, is in my bio that you can read in the chats. I am the director of also, not, in addition to working at the executive mansion in Richmond, I'm also the director of collections and visitor engagement at Stratford Hall, which happens to be the birthplace of Robert E. Lee. I was brought here uh, directly after the events in Charlottesville after 2017 to elevate and amplify the story of the enslaved African and African Americans at Stratford. My work historically has been um, both in history and archeology. span I straddle both worlds, which I think 
think is really important. I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a moment. But Stratford Hall is an incredibly important site. It is in the northern neck of Virginia. And I think personally, knowing that there had been 40 plus years of archaeology done at Stratford Hall and an, absent of, an absence of stories told about the enslaved community, this particular position was incredibly appealing to me, especially in that political moment of Charlottesville. I've always been dedicated to social justice, like those of us on this panel. I have dedicated my entire life to telling the history and stories of those who were enslaved throughout the diaspora. So for me, this particular site in that particular moment with the presence of archeological records and an active archeology span sort of program here, um, mostly in the lab stage at this moment has really given me and Stratford the ability to tell stories in a very unique and broad way. So Stratford Hall was built um, in 1738 by enslaved Africans and African Americans, as well as indentured Europeans. And it is quite a spectacular site. So I'm going to talk for a moment about traditional historians. And again, I straddle both worlds. And so I was always that one archaeologist in those history classes trying to bring to light the, uh, the idea of using archaeology, the importance of material culture. So traditional historians up until very recently have really relied almost solely on the written record. And this right here is a 70, 1782 inventory of the enslaved community here at Stratford Hall. And of course, there's some very important information here. You see the names of different enslaved people, you see their ages, you see sometimes what their occupation was, and you see how much they were valued. This kind of historical research is absolutely important in understanding the history of anybody, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that if you were not a person in power, if you did not happen to be someone like Thomas Lee or any of the other elite Virginians who are writing their own sort of histories, um, your records are really sort of distilled down for traditional historians into these written records. And so even as historians approach these very important documents now, they are now starting to employ things that, that scholars of African American studies and anthropology have been doing for, for decades, is they're reading against the archive. So a traditional historian will come in and look at this and have a very sort of simple idea of the community that was here. And when you read against the archive, you start thinking about, you know, who these people were, who you know, the person named Caesar, who was the enslaved chef here, what was his life like? How can we sort of pull out additional information and start to really fill in the gaps of history that's written on these documents about these very important people? So one of the most important things that archaeology brings to this conversation, into the understanding of these people, their lives, their contributions to this nation, is to bring in particular objects that belong to them, to really help color in this very sort of simple narrative with objects that belong to the people who were once, say, enslaved here at Stratford Hall. And it gives people, you know, history in general gives people a pride in self. And so when there are communities that have historically been oppressed, when there are communities that have been left out of the written records, when there are communities that are still learning about their history starting on a slave ship and not knowing about the history of the West African kingdoms and the empires that existed before the slave trade, not knowing about the objects that archaeologists are able to find and tell stories with, those kinds, of, those, those kinds of histories affect present day people in multiple kinds of ways. So what I'm gonna do, and for the rest of this very short talk, is I wanna talk about some of my favorite archeological objects. And I wanna talk particularly about what archeology span gives us. So we can absolutely, and we must use the written record, but we have to do other things. Archeology span allows us to give voices to people who are not in the written record. It allows their objects to tell stories about who they were, how they persevered, uh, what kinds of food they ate, how they dressed themselves, the ways in which they used objects to persevere and survive their status as enslaved. And history can, we touch history, so history can touch us. There is nothing more powerful. If any of you listening have not been on a dig and not had the absolute privilege of touching something that is coming out of the ground when the last person who touched that was hundreds of years ago or a hundred years ago, it is in that moment of touching that history that my life was changed when I was 17 and countless other archaeologists as well have sort of been affected by that particular moment. So some of my favorite 
objects that I want to talk about today, the ways in which uh, these objects have helped us here at Stratford tell a better story, a broader story, and a more honest story about those who were once occupying and building this land. Um, this right here is a crystal waste bead that was found in what's called the Oval Site here at Stratford Hall, which was where the temporary housing was set up for those enslaved Africans and others who were building the big house. And this right here is a waste bead that you find in some archaeological sites. They are still very rare. And this was excavated by Mary Washington University. And waste beads were typically worn by West African women and continue to be today around their waists, around their ankles, around their wrists, around their neck. And these were given to these women as a rites of passage, um, as a way, you know, you're, you get your periods, you get, a, you know, a, a string of beads and sort of as a marker of womanhood. And women would collect these things over time. So this particular object found in that site is able to give voice to those enslaved women who were brought on that slave ship, who were sold into slavery, who labored at Stratford Hall, and who somehow were able to hang on to something from their motherland. And this particular bead right here speaks to the history and perseverance of African women, of African American women who had to labor at Stratford and other places. And when I, I give this, I, there's certain objects that I'm showing you today that I will insist on sharing and letting people touch, especially with the descendant community. When we've had the descendants come out to Stratford and I'm able to take these things out of the cases where they are really presented in our new exhibit, just like the Hope Diamonds, you are getting pulled in by the precision light to see something like this that is so important to this African part of this history. When you give these objects, to the descendants, let them hold their ancestors' objects, it gives them a sense of pride. And this is something that written records just do not do. It is a visceral and emotional reaction to our history, and it is something that is imperative in telling the stories of those people who have historically been oppressed um, in the diaspora and throughout the, quote, uh, colonies. This right here is another phenomenal object. I'm going to move my little screen here so you can see it. This right here is also from the Oval Site. So a significant percentage of the enslaved people at Stratford who came from West Africa were from the Senegambia region. This right here is a pipe that would have been used in the North African sort of um, areas and even up into Southern Europe. And this would have been traded down to one of those Muslim people who were here enslaved at Stratford. We're doing some research now, and we've got at least 13 people that we can look at their names um, from that area who are in the probates here at Stratford, who were practicing Islam, and who somehow, um, one of them was able to carry this pipe. It's made out of either tortoise shell or amber with a sterling silver lip. We were able to carry this pipe across the Middle Passage. So we have two objects in our collections on exhibit now that really help illuminate and elevate and amplify the objects that meant so much to these people. And these kinds of things, this humanizes all of it. When you see lists of names, there's a natural reaction to kind of disengage. When you touch an object like this, it gives you literally, you're touching that history and that history touches you. This right here, oh my goodness. This, um, so this is not, this was not excavated in the ground, um, but it was found in the walls of the house. And so I know a lot of British folks call this house archeology. span So I'm just gonna throw this in here anyways. So I think it's fantastic. This right here is a piece of, of calcite crystal with an X on both sides. It was found in the northeast windowsill deep down in when they were doing some renovations here a couple of decades ago. It was put on a shelf labeled as flint, not known, you know, what it was really until recently. When my curator, Amy Connolly, pulled this out as they were doing our exhibit, which is actually called The Crossroads, different story. Um, she pulled this out and showed it to me and I knew exactly what this was. So the house, here at Stratford Hall was constructed by a combination of enslaved Africans, enslaved African Americans, indentured white laborers, and then paid laborers as well. And some of the people that were working inside of the house doing the plaster work, doing the carpentry, were enslaved Africans. This right here was purposely carved by one of those enslaved Africans with an X on both sides as the, co the Congo cosmogram, as a conjuring symbol, as the crossroads to conjure the spirits 
of their ancestors, of the deities to be able to come and protect whomever was in that house. And this was put in that house, in that, in, in that windowsill, in the northeast quadrant, which is very much in line with hoodoo practitioners' uh, beliefs and using the northwest and northeast corners to conjure spirits. And this was put so far down, down deep into that windowsill that everyone I've spoken to, including our director of preservation, said that that, that piece you know, that was lifted up where they found this had not moved since the construction of the house. So this object specifically when handed to descendants, when handed to anybody, tells the story of resistance, tells the story of spirituality, tells the story of fear and of hope and of the ways in which these enslaved African people used their religion, used their traditional cultures to help themselves survive in a foreign and terrifying place. This right here is not from Stratford, but this is my last object that I want to share with you all. This is in my teaching collection. Um, this is a what was labeled as a dog collar from a site in Towano, Virginia, which is down by Williamsburg. It was a 1770 site. And this right here um, was labeled as a dog collar. It's not a dog collar. This right here, uh, through the research I've been doing, I'll be working on an article on this pretty soon. This right here, if you see, it says 1733, and it says John right there. This is a, what was once a slave collar that you can see examples of right here. And in 1733, there was a, one of the most significantly large and, and important slave revolts occurred in St. John in the Caribbean. And a group of Akan warriors were enslaved and shipped off to St. John and they arrived and they took over the island. They were not going to, in their opinion, be enslaved. They wanted to set up a West African system of slavery there. Within six months, multiple nations came and shut down the revolt and they sold people off that were part of the revolt into the different colonies. This right here, in my opinion, from what I've read and know about the site, this right here, was maybe one of the collars that was worn by one of the enslaved people who were part of that, but it has been flattened. And so what I think of when I see this is I think of a slave collar that was probably broken at some point during this moment of six months of revolutionary takeover. And just like you have those coins that you get at Alcatraz and Plymouth, where they, you know, you stamp a penny and it turns into a souvenir. In my opinion, through my research, this is a souvenir from one of the enslaved rebels, warriors that made it through all of that and was then brought with them to Virginia. And this object, you can imagine, was, was held in great you know, regard and treasured by whomever owned it. And can you imagine the stories that were told around this collar that was once the most oppressive symbol you can imagine, turning into a, a symbol of, of revolt and freedom? So these are the kinds of things that archaeologists have access to. These are the kinds of things that give power and pride to the descendants and to a nation, honestly. We should be proud that people fought for their freedom. In addition to people like Patrick Henry and the other sort of very important revolutionary heroes, there were enslaved people and indigenous people who fought for their freedom. And they need to be held in the same regard, in the same light, with the same respect as our founding fathers. And it is objects like this that tell their stories, that give the descendant community pride in this history. This is breaking away from those basic uh, you know, lists of enslaved folks with their worth and giving the children of tomorrow and the children and adults of today a reason to be proud of their ancestors, knowing that their history was not as simple as being bound to a site, but they fought, they persevered, and they maintained their culture through these objects that archaeologists have the ability to access. And I'm going to end my little talk here by talking very briefly about what we started this last year at Stratford Hall. We have what is called now the First Africans Day. And this is a full day in July that commemorates the first group of Africans and African Americans that came and started building Stratford Hall. And we now have a growing and strong and dedicated group of descendants that are from all over the country that came this last July. Some of them were from families that had never met each other. And basically we got the money, 
we had the objects to show and we let the descendants plan the entire day. There were no white people up there with microphones. It was 100% descendant driven. And it was second to my son's birth, the most powerful day of my life. And it is in these moments where we can bring together this history, we can bring together the objects, let the descendants hold the objects that once belonged to their ancestors, give access to this history. There are so many walls built up between disciplines, between historians, between archaeologists, between museums, between descendants. All of those walls need to come down because this is our history. So I get really preachy. I'm going to stop talking. But I wanted to end on this note because it is in these moments that we could heal as a nation. And archaeology, in my opinion, is the primary medium in conjunction with working with allies, working with descendants, working with sites, to be able to break down these walls, have a real honest conversation about what these objects mean to people now, what they meant then, and how history matters. I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to pass the microphone to Matthew Reeves. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Dietz. As, as always, you're inspiring and uh, um, that, that flows in perfectly with that, what I'm going to be talking about, which is looking at the intersection between uh, descendants, archaeology, and the institutions that manage the, uh, these historic sites. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and share screens because what I want to do uh, in the beginning here is introduce the, um, the, the folks I'm gonna be uh, talking about in my presentation. Um, and so um, I'm, uh, I'm co-presenting uh, co, um, uh, this with Dr. Iris Ford, who can't be here today, but she and I went over this presentation and she um, gave me, uh, when she knew she couldn't attend because of, because of a medical issue, she gave me uh, the talking points that she really uh, wanted me to get across in to represent the Montpelier Descendant Committee. Um, but what I wanted, what we want to do today is talk about, uh, give an evaluation uh, of the 20 year history of work between archaeology, Montpelier and the Montpelier Descendant Community, uh, which formed into the Montpelier Descendant Committee uh, two years ago. And the, the three players that we're going to be, I'm going to be introducing is uh, Montpelier, uh, the Montpelier Foundation, which is made up, uh, is, is the group that manages uh, the um, 2,650 acre uh, property uh, that today is, is uh, open to the public and um, so celebrates the, 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 the lives of enslaved at Montpelier, the contributions that James Madison made and the contributions that all made to the founding of this country, especially through, through the lens of the constitution. And with, with the symbol I have right here, James Madison's Montpelier, this symbol is meant to represent the, the leadership of Montpelier. Uh, so the, um, the governing body of Montpelier, the board and the executive office. The second is the, um, this LEARN logo that we, we've used over the past decade, which is uh, we use for our public programs. It's with the Mark Montpelier Archaeology Department. And this one I'm using in this evaluative process of the, these intersecting uh, roles. The, the research and museum staff at Montpelier. And then the final is the uh, Montpelier Descendant Committee logo. Um, the Montpelier Descendant Committee is a 501c3 organization. Uh, Dr. Ford is the uh, vice chair. The chair is uh, James French, um, uh, both of whom are, are, are regional descendants. And the, the, the MDC is a democratic institution that brings together a broader community of descendants and anyone, any person of the African diaspora heritage who feels an affiliation with Montpelier. And so um, like being a democratic institution, the Montpelier uh, Descendant Committee has their own uh, bylaws, their own laws of governance and uh, ways of, of uh, in ensuring representation of, uh, of community members in, 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 a, uh, in an affiliated organization. And mu much of the work of, of having th these groups work together was summarized in a three-day workshop that we held in 2018. I think a number of you all are familiar with this. Um, um, it's the, the rubric for uh, engaging descendant communities. And in, in the chat, I'm putting in a link to the rubric, which is a document that came out of this three-day meeting that consisted of 57 um, 
historians, archaeologists, interpreters um, at sites of, uh, of museums and sites that interpret slavery in, in African American history, and also uh, descendants. And this, um, this rubric was meant to be a uh, methodology, as Dr. Blakey put it, who is part of this, was built for climbing and not resting. And what this means is it's an evaluative, what we came up with, with was an evaluative document that had that added at center three different pillars. The first was how to evaluate an institution's multidisciplinary research in conjunction with the, uh, with the descendant com community. And this, the, the, this evaluative process looks at you know, what kind of collaboration was occurring with the community, the transparency of, of data sources. So much like um, uh, Dr. Dietz was talking about is, you know, using varying lines of evidence to you know, to bring different, uh, to light different, different parts of this history. And it goes from unsatisfactory to exemplary. And again, this is meant to look at, you know, the ghosts of um, Christmas past, present, and future. And that's what we're going to be looking at here at Montpelier to evaluate that. This, the second pillar is interpretation, you know, how we take that research and how we involve the descendant community in talking about these stories that represent the, the, the heritage and the legacy of the descendants. I mean, these are, these are very personal stories we're presenting and, and involving the descendant community involves expanding those stories significantly and how we present them to the public. And then the final and one of the most important ones is relationship building. And in this, what we're referring to is how the descendant community is integrated into uh, a place at the table of sharing power. And this involves boards uh, uh, applying for money, uh, say over moving from advisory groups to, um, to actually uh, being part of the decision making. And for this, this presentation, what we're using is a, is, a, is a slider that goes from tokenism to full partnership and evaluating this 20 year, year history. And what we're referring to this in terms of these different rankings is tokenism is what it sounds like. It's where, you know, invitation is sent to selected individuals, in this case, descendants, which is mainly geared towards press releases, openings of exhibits, but there is no consultation involved in the actual creation or the actions that are being celebrated with those descendants representing just being present, you know, checking that box. The second, you know, kind of mid-range is one where um, uh, it's inclusion, and that's where uh, institution is consulting with a broader group of descendants, but it's through advisory groups. So the advice can either be taken or left at the table after the discussions uh, happen. The, the full realization is full partnership with descendant communities. And this is where uh, decision making, you know, that, 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 that decision making doesn't end at the advisory group. It's in final decisions that are made. So this is working with the descendants. And this is what the, the, the rubric is meant to help eval institutions evaluate. But what is it when an institution doesn't work with descendants. What does not working with descendants look like at a place like Montpelier and these historic sites? And it's where, you know, what dominates the room is this, this white presence, the columns, the, the, the owner, and in its absence, because of the heritage that this country has with racism, that means that decisions are informed by racism and it's, it's not critically uh, examined. And that creates obviously all kinds of problems. And so we're using this ranking system to look at the 20 years of work that we've done at Montpelier with the descendant community. And one of the first projects we worked on, which I'll touch on at the end of the presentation, is um, the work at the Gilmore Cabin, which is a, uh, a cabin that was built by uh, two um, uh, uh, enslaved, enslaved individuals who were, who were owned by the Madison family, who were freed after emancipation and in the 1870s built a homestead that it today is at Montpelier. This is what started much of our, our research and, and, and centers uh, so much of what we do. But some of the process that is much more, you know, in the lens of the public eye and what every visitor sees and what represents Montpelier is the work we've done around the main house and the visitor core. So I want to evaluate the work we did on the restoration of the house, which led to the South Yard study. Um, the other project that we're going to focus on is the Slave Cemetery, where memorialization is, is beginning to occur, and this led to the formation of the Montpelier Descendant Committee. Um, and then final is, as an example of how this process can work and or not work, is the NEH-funded um, study of the home farm, uh, which is the main farm complex from the Madison era 
uh, right below the visitor center. So with the um, with the with you know what dominates these places, beginning with the main house um, from. 2002 through 2008, we went through a $25 million restoration of the main house. And that, that restoration in, did not involve the descendant community at all. Uh, and, but in the, in the opening ceremony in the fall of 2008, two members of the descendant community were invited to uh, be present on the front portico. And really, uh, that it was a, kind of a classic example of, of tokenism. And this came came to bear when we started, when we had our second descendant gathering in 2008, that same year. And we invited descendants out on the restored uh, terrace uh, that overlooks the South Yard. And the South Yard is the area where we know from a documentary source that there were the, the residents of enslaved domestics and, and the work buildings that were attached to the main house. And one of the descendants that was on this tour, uh, Dr. Iris Ford, who's, who's um, um, my co-presenter today, she asked the question, okay, you just showed us a $25 million restoration that you did of Madison's home. But then when you're representing our ancestors' homes, you're showing, you're representing them with what appear, appear to be railroad ties and dead or cut grass. You know, is there a discrepancy in this representation? And, you know, we, we took the mea culpa and, you know, realized we need we needed to change this so in consulting with the descendant community what we did is we built a set a set of three years later built a set of descent of um, timber frames but also engaged in a uh, applying for a multi-year NEH grant in 2009 for doing archaeology on the homes of the enslaved Americans at Montpelier and we did two excavations well, the main one focused on the South Yard, the quarters for house slaves, and we discovered just incredible evidence for these buildings that allowed us to gather enough information where we could restore these buildings back to the period with the same degree of accuracy of the main house. And also did excavations at the um, at the home farm as well, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in a minute. But as part of this three-year project from 2010 through 2013, what we also developed was a set of public archaeology programs that involved, uh, you know, bringing the, uh, uh, public participants through everything from metal detector surveys to locate sites that, especially sites of labor that are more difficult to locate, doing excavations, which is the mainstay of these programs, analysis in the lab, and then also reconstructed reconstruction reconstruction of these of these buildings through ghosted uh, outlines, and what we labeled this was learn, which is locate, excavate, analyze, reconstruct a network. And during this three years, we invited members of the descendant community to come out on these programs and we offered scholarships for descendants to come and dig for free at the place where they were enslaved. And later on, you know, we didn't have much results from this. And in talking with descendants later on about this, what they said was, you know, when you, when you presented, you know, the idea that um, we as descendants could come dig at the plantation for free, what it brought to mind was, hey, our ancestors went through that and it didn't work out that well for them. And so without direct involvement with descendants, we ended up presenting a program that was by appearance is racist. It didn't matter what our intent was, appearance was that it was informed by racism and created a real residence for our descendants to take part in this. And when we started the, the restoration of the South Yard, what we did to overcome this was begin to partner in a major way with local community institutions in, in setting up the schedules. So instead of having a program schedule that was on our time schedule, we paired it with, um, with family reunions, with events such as the Slave Dwelling Project. And what occurred was we had an outpouring of participation. And in these participatory events, all sorts of discussions came up like uh, Dr. Dietz was just talking about. And more importantly, what we did is we recorded these conversations. And one of the things that came up was with the, the, the restoration of, the, of the, the quarters for for the enslaved Americans in the South Yard right beside the main house, what descendants requested is the same degree of honor and respect that's presented for Madison in the main house be extended to their ancestors. And what came from this was an exhibit that we that we entitled the, the mere distinction of color that looks at the intersection between race, slavery, and the Constitution, brings the legacy of the Constitution into the present day through the voices of descendants. 
And where all this came from was an advisory group that we put together with the um, with the uh, um, the interpretive department. And having this happen really took some convincing of the the the, the museum uh, division as a whole because there's timetables that need to be met, donors demands that need to be met. But when it when all was said and done, what came for this? was not just the, uh, you know award-winning exhibit, but a museum staff that was all in on collaboration with the descendant community. And the, the ideas that are in this exhibit were all co-created with, with, the, with the descendants. And it led to more, more along the lines of full partnership in, in this exhibit and ownership over this by all. Um, more recently, what we have is a project that, um, that was coming about at the same time as the, uh, the exhibit, which was a study of the slave cemetery. And the slave cemetery is just down the hill from the Montpelier Visitor Center where the Red Star is. And for years, we, knew, we, we believed that the slave cemetery, which, is, which was a much smaller area of, of about 38 graves, um, we had not done any GPR to locate anything beyond the depressions and the, and the stones. But in 2018, at the prompting of the community, we did a ground penetrating radar survey. And what we found was that the slave cemetery was about four, four to five times the size we originally thought it was, and went from uh, a, a burial ground of 45 individuals to over 200. And so what the significance of this was, is anyone with ancestry at Montpelier knew that their ancestors were more than likely buried in this cemetery. And what this led to was, you know, the, the traditional memorialization we did at the cemetery began to take a higher significance and what it led to was ideas of creating a national memorial for ens enslaved people at Montpelier and the, and the region and the nation. And this led to the formation of the Montpelier Descendant Committee. And much of the ethos that went into discussions we have had with the, ru had with the rubric and exhibits and archaeology went, in, went into this formulation. And it led to uh, the Montpelier Descendant Committee receiving a $1 million grant between which was an MOA between the state of Virginia, Montpelier Descendant Committee and the Montpelier Foundation. And um, what uh, this grant in, in, in entitles everyone to is a seat at the table. And what this led, what we have not begun to work on this grant yet because this, the MOA between the Montpelier Foundation and the MBC has not been, work, been worked out yet. And, and an example of this, of this process is another grant that we recently received with the MBC, which was an NEH grant to look at the uh, a very rich farm, uh, early 19th century work and living site of the enslaved community right below the Montpelier Visitor Center. And in 2019, we received an NEH collaborative grant that was between the, the Montpelier Archaeology Department and the MDC. And what, what at the mainstay of this grant was the clientage model as developed by Dr. Michael Blakey, who's also a descendant at Montpelier, um, uh, in engaging descendants uh, in re the research process. And what this involves is, in this case, the NEH project, the ethical client is the Montpelier Descendant Committee. We have placed in the hands of the Montpelier Descendant, Descendant Committee the, um, the, uh, the ethical role of producing the questions that are asked of their ancestors and informing the methodology of what will be used. We as professionals, archeologists, provide the expertise on uh, how we you know, generate this information to answer these questions. And that relationship is one that was, you know, has been established over these 20 years. That where we're at with this though is a big question. And the reason why there's a question is the business client, which is the Montpelier Foundation, the board, and working with the MDC has not yet developed a fully functioning relationship. This is still a, a fraught process of sharing power. And unfortunately, what this has led to is also in, is in, informed by, in terms of much of this is, you know, deciding who holds this power, which in the case of an institution can often be informed by racism and is in this case, has also led to a fraught relationship between leadership at Montpelier and staff. So these are all things that have come about to question how this works, but it's come about through a process, a 20 year process in which um, kind of the take, takeaways are, you know, listening to the community. I mean, it's a pretty easy uh, thing to state, but in that listening, it's offering the space 
to have the community speak and speak in a way that's that's inclusive. And part of this is, you know, having having follow through in the conversations that you have with the community. The other thing that we've learned about this process and is what process and it's what made it largely successful is engaging our peers in the process. And with that, I, what I mean is moving from, you know, peers who would otherwise be allies into accomplishes. And one of the best statements of, of this process is by the Society for Black Archaeologists, which is to be, a, be an accomplice, not an ally. Allies can jump out at any time. Accomplices are implicated. Have the back of your Black colleagues and students, and in this case, the community. The other part that has been extremely important in the work we're doing is the um, the institutionalization of the relationship. We, we began with Orange County African American Historical Society. This was a, a, a group that here in Orange County that began with Rebecca Gilmore Coleman, who is the descendant of the, um, of the, uh, the Gilmore family of the Gilmore cabin, and then also uh, Carolyn French, whose son today is the chair of the Montpelier Descendant Committee. But with the, uh, the, with the, um, with the OCAHS, through the years, we've done numerous events where there's been a participation of a of a of, of a um, of a democratically inspired uh, group such as the OCHS that has has bylaws. But what has been really central to this is with the MDC being created is codifying relationships. And this is where you know if there's anything with Section 106, which happens with with uh, with um, the NEH grant, for example, is that the, the, the descendants and their organizations are es established as interested parties at, at a minimum. In terms of writing grants, it's bringing descendants more, more in more than just as an advisory role, but in a fiduciary role that gives consent and exercise of equal opportunity. And then finally, like the work we're doing with the Descendant Committee on the uh, memorialization is developing MOUs and MOAs that guarantee partnership and full power sharing. And one of the things that is really um, an, an honor to have at the base of Montpelier is uh, having the Montpelier Descendant Committee being established at Montpelier. And the Montpelier Descendant Committee is establishing a set of partnerships with surrounding communities that go that run from the watersheds of the James River along the Southwest Mountain Chain down along the Rappahannock River, because these plantations such as Montpelier, the connections didn't end at the plantation boundaries where land ownership was. These connections were between community communities beside each other. And today those descendants have a broad can form a broad coalition that allows even more power to be instilled in these kind of institutionalized um, uh, organizations. So uh, looking forward to the uh, conversation that we're gonna be having today. And I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reeves. You've engendered a few questions from the audience and I'd just like to encourage folks, um, the participants to please add your questions to the Q&A. And now uh, we'd like to turn the microphone to Chief Ann Richardson and Dr. Julia King. Good morning or good afternoon. I don't know which one it is now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so yes, I'm Chief Ann Richardson. Julie, could you share your screen? Um, there we go. So yeah, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the invitation to be a part of this um, webinar. Uh, this has been thrilling to hear all of the things that are being done. Um, and we've, we've got some thrills of our own uh, to share with you. Um, uh, the Rappahannock Tribe is located in uh, Indianette, Virginia, King and Queen County. And um, we are a community settled uh, from our last treaty uh, of 1683. Uh, land was appropriated for us here. And um, even though the treaty was dishonored, our people have remained here in this community. Uh, spanning four counties, really, uh, King and Queen, Caroline, Essex, and King William. And so uh, we engaged with Dr. King probably five years ago, 
and um, on um, a grant from the National Park Service, and they're wanting to document document our indigenous cultural landscape. Um, and so, when you started working with Dr. King, um, people began to gather around maps and um, tell stories of um, people going there at certain seasons of the year and people fishing in certain places at certain seasons of the year. Uh, and it really opened up for us uh, a landscape that had been long forgotten. Um, and, and Dr. King and her work opened that up, verified the locations of these towns for us that we had frequented for thousands of years and um, validated our oral history. Uh, that we had been given as children. So uh, it's been an amazing journey. Um, so I just want to thank Dr. King and all the archaeologists that are out there doing this amazing work and uncovering history that none of us would know anything about if it weren't for you guys. So um, Julie, are, are you ready with your PowerPoint? I am Chief Ann. Can everybody hear me? Just put a thumbs up if you can, because my screen is focused on uh, the uh, PowerPoint. Great, thank you. So thank you, Chief Ann, for that great introduction. And thank you, Dr. Dietz and uh, Dr. Reeves and Dr. Ford for uh, some really hard acts to follow. So uh, um, I'll try to do my best and, um, and we'll see where we go from, uh, from there. So. I do wanna, uh, as Chief Ann said, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute and then reshare because my computer doesn't want to. Um, all right, let me go ahead and share. All right, let's see. All right, very good. You guys can see the screen is working. All right, so um, as Chief Ann noted, I did meet her, I first met Chief Ann in, 2015, uh, when Deanna Beecham, who was then working with the National Park Service, took me down to Indian Neck to talk about a project that was focused on the uh, Rappahannock indigenous cultural landscape. Now, these projects are a lot of work, um, but they are also very rewarding because they got a couple of archeologists, my colleagues, Virginia Busby, Martha McCartney, Scott Strickland and me, um, out into the landscape with people who saw the same landscape, but through very different eyes. Um, amazingly, very generous landowners opened their properties to us. Um, unlike the um, uh, Kelly and Matt's presentations, you know, we're trying to look at uh, a, a, a huge river valley. Um, and uh, they, the tri uh, these people opened their landscapes to us. The tribe shared their places that they thought were of interest and they, they wanted us to visit. They shared their stories and together, the tribe, the National Park Service, the Chesapeake Conservancy, who were also a part of this, and the archeologists were able to develop important materials that not only served the National Park Service, which funded the project, but also the tribe. Now, sometimes it's hard to look into your crystal ball and see what can be until it is unfolding before you. What began as an important project to serve an important public aim, the Chesapeake Trail, which is the short version of the Smith Trail, uh, soon turned into this ongoing relationship that uh, has both supported tribal goals and agendas, and in the process has made me a better archeologist. Matt, as I was listening to you talk about the learning that you went through, I, I, I just thought, you know, I could so relate. Um, there are several areas where archaeology can help support, in our case, the Rappahannock tribe. But in general, I think these uh, uh, points could apply to all communities. Um, these include affirming oral histories and traditions, as Chief Ann said, restoring memory where it has been lost through people being forced off the landscape, supporting tribal educational efforts, assisting with inventorying in indigenous archaeological sites and landscapes, assisting with federal and state historic preservation reviews and grants, um, providing in information for identifying and prioritizing land conservation, act actually making indigenous people a part of that movement, which has historically been very white, 
um, challenging colonized narratives of indigenous history and supporting tribal cultural sovereignty. Um, after our work with on the indigenous cultural landscape project, um, we had a far better understanding of where archaeology stood in the Rappahannock Valley. And that is to say, we saw that very little work in the River Valley had been done, um, with the exception of a few, few key sites at Camden near Port Royal and Corotelman uh, near the River's Mouth. The tribe, however, was very enthusiastic um, about how archaeology could be used to affirm and enrich tribal history. Um, so we decided to make a go of it. Um, archaeologists can provide the content um, or the empirical evidence that supports tribal oral history. And where tradition and history have been lost as a result of colonization, archaeology becomes a way to restore that memory. We've received funding from a lot of generous um, organizations to do these wide landscape surveys. Um, that are very tricky because we are dealing with um, a lot of private property as well as public property. And so I see our role as assistants, right? As maybe not employees, but as consultants or assistants who collect and format the information um, in ways that the tribe can use. Um, and for example, in historic and land preservation and land conservation um, efforts, um, our work with the tribe nominating the Chief OS and Susie P. Nelson House to the National Register of Historic Places is a really good example. Um, with the house hidden beneath a canopy of ever encroaching trees, you can see that through this drone shot, and in urgent need of uh, stabilization, Chief Ann suggested to us the National Park Service's grants for underrepresented communities for this project. And within the all-in help of the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, which served as the applicant for the project, we secured funds to support the National Register nomination of this important building. Now, the Chief uh, Nelson House is the spot where the tribe began its formal reorganization exactly 100 years ago in 1921, led by Rappahannock Tribal Chief, Chief uh, Otho Nelson, uh, uh, and his wife, Susie, um, and Otho Nelson is Chief Ann's grandfather. It was from this location that tribal members asserted their tribal identity, prepared a new generation of indigenous citizens through tribal schools, operated an apothecary, and pushed back hard against Virginia's Racial Integrity Act. I don't have time to tell you about all of that pushback, but it was, it was very hard. The significance of this space in Rappahannock state and national history I don't think can be overstated. And the ever forward thinking Rappahannock tribe had already acquired the land in the late 1990s to ensure its preservation. So NPS funding allowed us to take this multidisciplinary approach to, pre to preparing the NR uh, nomination, oral history, archeology, span architectural documentation, and landscape analysis. And DHR recommended the property for listing um, when, it, when that, all that was done. This in turn allowed the Chief Nelson House to be eligible for additional funding, which the tribe has been very successful in getting and efforts are now underway to stabilize, preserve, and develop the property as an interpretive uh, site. The archaeological work has also been an important data point for the tribe in its participation in land conservation efforts. For example, in 2018, when the Conservation Fund was working, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to acquire a portion of Phones Cliffs, which is um, west of Warsaw on the north side, and uh, the Conservation Fund and Fish and Wildlife were uh, seeking tribal support, we identified, um, quote, Indian Peter living in the vicinity in the first quarter of the 18th century. Now, the tribe already knew that this was a sacred space because of its topography, um, view shed, and association with the Smith Voyage. The discovery of Indian Peter in, in this landscape, perhaps the maker of, the, of this flaked table glass fragment, strengthened the tribe's support of the Fish and Wildlife acquisition. Ever since, with support from Fish and Wildlife and in service to the tribe, we have been conducting surveys on this property. The archaeological um, work and uh, or va validating tribal tradition and oral history, and in some respects, decolonizing, and I realize that that word has been used lightly, so I'm trying not to use it lightly here. Um, decolonizing the narrative told about Rappahannock history 
for now over a century is perhaps one of the most important things we do. Briefly, the fact that John Smith, when he mapped the Rappahannock Valley in the summer of 1608, he depicted Rappahannock towns almost entirely along the river's north bank. And this has led anthropologists and historians since 1907 to read this as evidence on the part of the Rappahannock of a fear of an all powerful, aggressive Powhatan. Rappahannock tradition, however, recalls something very different, cooperative relationships, especially during winter hunting expeditions. I mean, these are really two very opposed interpretations of what's going on. And in, and in fact, I bought in to that historical uh, interpretation, but the ICL project uh, uh, schooled me very quickly. Um, archaeological analysis bears out a tribal um, tradition. Um, Rappahannock towns were al aligned along the river's bank in the summer of 1608 because as this sensitivity map shows, resources important to the Rappahannock lifeways were found in greater abundance and proximity on the river's north bank than on the south bank. The river was not a political boundary or a boundary of any sort at all. It was more of a main street. Um, during winter months, towns would move, often to the south side, um, for winter hunting exp uh, expeditions. So we have to ask ourselves, why has Powhatan been rendered as this fearsome, aggressive um, force? And the answer, I think, really lies in who's doing the talking about Powhatan. Documents written by colonizers who were living in the heart of Powhatan territory, who were not perhaps the best guests, and who in the process have ended up constructing an inaccurate understanding, I think of the Powhatans and definitely of the Rappahannocks. Archaeology can challenge these narratives. This is not to say that archaeology is perfect. Our discipline was born in the colonial state and our history is littered with examples of archaeology being used in ways that reinforce unequal uh, power structures in terms of who owns or controls the past. But the study of pots or artifacts or houses or landscapes is not inherently colonial. It is the relationships that we develop with the stakeholders that ultimately shape how archeology span is of value to communities or not. So in closing, I would recommend to anyone interested in working with communities to prioritize, not necessarily artifacts, but relationships with those community members and with those individuals and agencies who have supported your work. Listen, stand down as needed, share power, indeed concede power, and amplify the voices of those whose communities have been notoriously absent from archeological research. Make archeology span work better for these communities. And if you do, archeology span will work better for all of us. I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Chief Anne. Okay. So thank you, Julie, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, and one, the takeaway from this for us is that um, Julie's work allowed us to see the vastness of the territory that we occupied and um, changed our perspective of uh, who we were as a tribe. Uh, going back into the record and looking at um, just the colonial um, notes made about our tribe and the traditional knowledge that we had that had been passed down, my dad had always told me that you know, wherever there's one town, there's another town on the other side of the river. It's the same town. And so when Smith comes through and he uh, names these towns um, as if they might have been a colonial town, uh, it was totally different for us. And uh, as um, Julie's gone back and looked at the Zunica map, when the Spanish came through, they wrote across the river these different towns. So they actually knew uh, that these towns were the same on both sides of the river. And so those kinds of um, pertinent information are very important to the tribe to know as they look at other areas that they occupied, uh, also this area. And it brings to the tribe uh, a, a repossession of their history, uh, a pride in 
knowing that their or what their landscape was and where their towns were, a pride in being confident in that that history that you are telling. Uh, and, and so it's really important for our people to return to these places. So we have something called the Return to the River program for our youth, and it's a um, it's actually a, a, a youth leadership program that we've developed to return our people to those places that our ancestors occupied, to walk on that land, to feel that landscape under your feet, to know that your ancestors walked there thousands of years before, and to hold those objects, as uh, Dr. Dietz said, in your hand and feel the power of those objects uh, in your hand and know that uh, you are connected to that land in a way that other people are not. Um, so it's been very powerful working with Julie and uh, discovering all of these wonderful things and um, the trade beads that have connected the Leedstown site with the Cliff site, um, you know, with the with the Chiefs house. Uh, all of these things that um, we that are connecting us, that are physical evidence of our connection. Uh, even in modern day times in the land that we live on now is very powerful for our tribe and shows the, um, the tenacity of our people to persevere and stay together and to survive all of this colonization and wars and all of the removal and disease and everything. And so it really is, um, is something that we help to instill in our young people that gives them pride in who they are pride in their people and how they persevered upon the land to today where we are now federally recognized, which was the dream of people in the 1900s when they all came back together and reorganized and a pride that a hundred years later, the dreams of our ancestors have been realized, that we're returning to the land, that we have the sovereign powers that we were first inherent ours. Um, it, it's, it's a restoration story that is so emotional for our people uh, and so healing for our people um, that we want others to be able to share in that. Uh, we have plans to um, be the good stewards of the land that we were originally using that traditional ecological knowledge to ensure that generations to come seven generations to come would have everything that they would have need of because we were careful enough to give back to the land that we were taking from. So it's, it's been a, uh, an amazing journey for me as a fourth generation chief in my family uh, from that hundred years ago, uh, reading the letters and going and collecting uh, and, and cataloging our archives to see the fight for the recognition, to see the fight to stay together, the strategies that our tribe had to use in order to accomplish that, um, to stand now and see those things accomplished is just phenomenal. It's uh, really miraculous and so restoring and, and so healing for our tribe. So Julie, unless you have something else to say, um, I think we're good. I think we're actually on schedule. So I'll okay. turn it back over to Sonia. But thank you for your presentation, Chief Ann. Thank you. Um, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Hi, well, uh, thank you to all of our panelists and, and, and thank you, Sonia. Um, I, I, I'm so excited to hear about these opportunities for connecting directly with the materials and the places of the past and through them the people of the past and our ancestors. And you know, I think this is really borne out in the sort of data sets and the nature of collaboration that all of our panelists have discussed today. Um, at this point, we'd like to uh, ask you all to answer some of the questions that we've received. A couple have come in through the Q&A and I'd like to just encourage the participants to keep them coming. Um, I'll start with uh, one here that I guess is, is directly for uh, Dr. Reeves. Um, the question is, 
how does the Montpelier Descendant Committee represent all descendants as opposed to the descendants representing themselves? In other words, how does the descendant community avoid the danger developed when institutions select individual descendants to repeat the message of the larger institution, otherwise known as tokenism? Yeah, no, thank you for that question, Tim. Uh, it, the, the definition of, the, for example, the Montpelier Descendant Committee is very much tied to uh, the kind of structure of, that uh, Chief Richardson is familiar with, with tribal organizations, which are defined as a, as a recognized governing body of any Indian tribe in the case of a tribal organization. And I'm reading this right off the um, off a, a internet definition, Chief Richardson, so please correct me. Um, and any, any legally established organizations of Indians, which is controlled, sanctioned, or chartered by such governing bar body, or which is democratically elected. So the, 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 the defining factor of uh, like the, the 5013C institution of the Montpelier Descendant Committee is it is a democratically based organization where there's not a single individual that uh, provides perspective on uh, what it means to be a descendant of Montpelier, what it means to be black. And this is born out of questions that descendants would be getting from the press, who we as, a, as an institution would select to appear at press appearances, and they would be asked such blanketing questions. And this, this inspired the creation of the Orange County African American Historical Society back in 2000, or in 1999, by um, uh, Rebecca Gilmore Coleman and uh, Carolyn French and also inspired the, the, uh, the Montpelier Descendant Committee. So, and it's especially relevant to have the Montpelier Descendant Committee at Montpelier, where you've got the father of the constitution, you know, the architect of the constitution for, uh, our, our, you know, the, what defines American uh, constitutional democracy. And, uh, you know, like um, many of y'all noted, the, the contributions of African-Americans to that process is one that is beginning to be explored. You know, the, these founding uh, fathers, such as Washington, Jefferson, and Madison, weren't operating in a vacuum where they came up with the, these ideas. It, these came up through lived experiences from working with Native Americans, working with African Americans. And so a founding principle is, you know, how these groups are part of the founding of the country. But the, yeah, the, this is, it's, it's all about democracy. That's what it's about. So there's a couple of questions here that and I, I think this kind of segues well that I think anybody, any of the panelists can venture and answer. And I'm going to combine them because they're talking about ways to get uh, descendant communities involved. So allow me to ask both here. Um, so the first is, what are some of the first steps to get some of this kind of work started? I work at Brownsville Preserve on the Eastern Shore, and it has a deep history, but of course, no one has really looked into the enslaved indigenous history of the property, which we are very interested in, and the opportunities to connect with descendants and the local community. So, the, so sort of the question about first steps, I guess, how do you, how do you track folks down and get them excited? Uh, the second question is, is kind of more about the excitement, um, and, and that is, are there any particular community programs or ideas that can bring the descendant community to understanding archaeology as part of empowerment? And this community to which uh, they're referring, it's a non-academic rural community. For example, we're doing a topical survey at a historic site and want to do a program to engage this community. Julie, I think you would be a good one to answer that because, um, so Julie had access to um, these landowners who are still living on land grants from the king uh, on our property. And um, she brought us together with them. And uh, we have become friends. Uh, they have stories about us that were passed down in their family. We have stories about them that was passed down through our families that they didn't know about. Um, so Julie, you might want to answer that. Well, just uh, using sort of the example of the Eastern Shore community and their interests, um, I, I do have to say that here's where some of the structure gets, gets in and, and makes things difficult. Um, and of course, as we know, as Matt pointed out, structure is often grounded, whether it wants to be or not, in racism, right? And so uh, you need resources to do these kinds of projects. Um, if it had not, excuse me, been for the National Park Service, 
um, we would not have we would not have met, and uh, I would not have this incredible opportunity to work in the Rappahannock Valley. And so, I think that one of the things that maybe those those people who are in charge of structures, which are usually in the, in the U.S. elected officials or, or you know, um, uh, donor type people in that serve communities, is to create pots of money that allow this. Um, archaeology, especially, is not inexpensive, um, and you know, it's survived in the ground for hundreds, thousands of years. Um, as you bring it out, you have to treat it with all, I mean, I mean it's not just uh, data, you know, it is, it, is, uh, it, it is somebody's patrimony. So I'll turn it over to some of my other colleagues who might have better ideas. And by the way, my friends would always say, your, your solution to everything is more money. So, <laughs> but in archaeology, that's kind of true. More money always helps. That is true, Julie. Really. The, the one thing that we've had tremendous success with in bringing communities together with archaeology is, you know, in your question, you're right. It's, you know, with a, a group who is not familiar with archaeology, archaeology doesn't automatically seem like the answer. And, you know, even like Dr. Dietz has stated, you know, having these amazing objects that people connect with, you got to have the people there to connect with them to make that work. And where we have found our best success in bringing people to the site in a particip participatory way is by figuring out where the wh what is a way to have that gathering take place. And so collaborating with uh, church events, collaborating with reunions, collab having your event, your archaeology program, open house, be part of what the community's uh, uh, outreach efforts are. But doing it on your own and just saying, hey, come to the site, it, I've always uh, fallen short and uh, embarrassingly short. <laughs> I think I would add to that too, with Zoom being this new normal, I think that there's an ability to offer free programs and get maybe an institution that would sponsor a Zoom program and offer it free to anyone to watch and have people like us on this panel, you know, step in and give a talk, get people excited about these things because the average person walking around, you know, they think of archeology, span it's like, oh yeah, you know, like Indiana Jones. It's like, there's some actual cool stuff that has nothing to do with, with fiction. So I think, you know, having organizations be able to partner you know, if you're a, a small site or something and if you can't even afford to have a proper webinar length, I guarantee there's museums and I can I can speak for myself at Stratford here. Um, we would be happy to hold some kind of panel like this and have it free for the public because access to information is one of the biggest issues we all face as a nation. And I think that we can easily do this with programs like this that are on Zoom. So um, archaeology is kind of an informational science as much as I think it, we'd like it to be. Um, and it's certainly engaging I, as much as we'd like it to be. And this is a question that kind of speaks to, I think, something that we all deal with. And it's something that um, I think we kind of struggle with, too. Uh, so this is coming from an archaeological colleague. Uh, not to be a Debbie Downer, but I would like to hear from the panelists on their thoughts about the limitations of archaeology. In my experience, I've tended to overpromise what archaeology can achieve, and sometimes that can lead to a desire to say more about the data than they might be able to tell us. Is that a problem for any of you, for any of your work? Do you feel like you are overpromising at times? I'll go ahead and start. I is this from Garrett by chance? Garrett Fessler. <laughs> That's smelled like Garrett Fessler, who's a dear old friend of mine. So <clears throat> Garrett and I have actually been having these conversations when we're going to be presenting on this topic uh, with Julie here in a few months. But I think that what you're getting at here, and I'm, I'm pretty confident in, in translating this into a different sort of uh, phrasing, but, you know, the, the sort of intersections between storytelling and hard science. And I think that there has been a pendulum swing back and forth, different generations. Um, I do believe that there is a way to infer. And the fact of the matter is, is that we cannot go back and write the history and get that empirical data and those smoking guns because they were taken away from so many people. So we have to 
bring an oral history, we have to be able to say this could be. I think just simply saying could be is enough. And I do not want to lose the ability of these objects to empower people and make them proud of their history because I don't know the name of the person that had that pipe or I don't know the exact person that put that crystal in the wall. But I think that we know enough collectively through interdisciplinary research, through our community partnerships to be able to tell stories. And the fact of the matter is, science aside, human beings love human stories, full stop. Archaeology helps bring that sort of hard data. It helps people like Chief Ann and others be able to say, look, there's actual science that proves this history, but we cannot be at risk of losing the storytelling parts of these objects because that is what brings people in. I love you, Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd all to add to that, uh, uh, Kelly, I'd say, um, bringing in questions and prioritizing questions that the community has about their own history, their own heritage, is a way to, um, to, to close that gap between what our might be overpromising expectations are and what is relevant to the community. Um, uh, we, we've found that, um, you know, everything from, like when we, we were talking about swept, swept clay yards with uh, descendant participants, we were looking at it from an analytical standpoint and that folks started sharing stories about their grandmothers when they were little kids, making them sweep the yard in the city in Richmond and being like, why do we have to do this grandma? And she would say, this is how you make a house a home. And so having these stories, having the, um, ha having the, uh, um, the, the analysis, the questions, the stories that we have be more inclusive of uh, descendants is an incredibly important way to close that gap. I'll just add too that, um, yeah, everything can overpromise, right? So, um, I mean, I didn't expect to see what we found when we started to, you know, tumble into that North, <clears throat> excuse me, North Bank hypothesis about, oh, everybody's afraid and they're hunkered down on the North Bank of the Rappahannock. Um, and so while that wasn't necessarily the, the interpretation for that came out of oral history, but it changes. I mean, the thread that that changes is, uh, it, it basically says, hey, you need to really go back and start and think about indigenous history and maybe how to rewrite it. And and to think about other data sources that are not just documents that were left behind by a bunch of people that happen to be, you know, occupying the middle of Powhatan territory. Um, but I, I, I realize we have some time, so maybe there's another question that we should do. Okay, uh, well, we, we do, let's see, we have a number of questions here. Um, so, okay, this one kind of captures uh, a couple of questions that have, have come along, um, and it's exciting when the, when the community, of course, is interested in more work. So uh, this is, uh, there are a number of initial archaeology studies involving indigenous, indigenous African-American, and King's Grant lands on the Nansman River. Each initial study has a recommendation for further study. What are the best next steps for engaging further study? Um, and I will, let me just go ahead and ask a, a sort of similar and related question here. Um, and as somebody from DHR, I almost think this is kind of a review and compliance question, but uh, how do we make sure we go about making sure the county we live in uh, does thorough research on grounds that have not been properly researched? Um, and then uh, this participant at, uh, asks about some specific sites, uh, major battlefields where United States colored troops were awarded medals of honor, um, as well as Wilton Farm. Um, so the question is, how can community members uh, go about inspiring and encouraging additional work? And I will say from the perspective of DHR, um, this kind of engagement ahead of any sort of threats to those resources is really exciting and I think really important. You know, going to the commission meetings, going to the town halls, um, reaching out to your policymakers and expressing your concern for these properties, um, if possible, you know, in, engaging with the people that own those properties as well, um, you know, and, and talking to DHR, there's a chance, there's a possibility that there have been studies conducted that aren't necessarily um, immediately accessible to the public, but that we might be able to talk about and, you know, inform on. So I'd encourage you to reach out to our agency as well in those instances. But 
Um, for those folks who are actually getting out in the field and on the ground, unlike the point ahead bureaucrat that I am, um, if you have anything to add for guidance for uh, the public to kind of engage their officials to get out there and, and encourage this work, please do share. I wanna just add something about gatekeeping. I've become obsessed with this word gatekeeping um, in archeology span lately and um, who gets access, um, who's allowed, who gets to interpret, who gets to uh, hold questions. And I think that some of our old gatekeeping methodologies might've worked back in the day and maybe they didn't work back in the day, but we really need to think about them. But I totally agree with you that it's a political process and that when I was with the advisory council, all I ever heard was get out in front, get out in front, anticipate, anticipate. And, you know, uh, uh, elected officials can be your, your best bet to try to see uh, some of this work before it goes to crisis. Yeah, a lot I've found what often becomes a real limitation, um, especially in the context of development when you have threats to archaeological sites because of, you know, proposed development, is really a, an apprehension about the timeline. Yes, archaeology can be expensive, but a lot of projects, you know, the cultural resource surveys are like a drop in a bucket compared to the overall investment. So bringing these, you know, concerns to the forefront early on, you know, creates an opportunity to include these plans early on, right? So in the planning process, so the timelines aren't disrupted, you know, causing the sorts of um, confusion and, and controversy that, you know, we often deal with as a regulatory body. So uh, just to echo what Dr. King has said, get, get out in front, ask the questions early and make sure that people know these, these, these sites are out there and that we care about them. That's a great idea um, and suggestion, Julie. Um, and I'll just make this uh, real brief. So our county has a historical society and they began to do uh, research on the history of the tribe. Um, but the inclusion of Native Americans was like a little short blurb. There was no real in-depth research done on uh, the occupied territory of the tribe. And it was only until we had our own historian uh, and our own archeologist that this information started to come to light and um, to places in the county that our tribal people lived and uh, institutions within our tribal community, such as our church and things like that. So um, for us, it's been a very independent thing. Um, you can't really depend on um, your elected officials because they are uh, often prejudiced and racist in their thinking. And uh, for us, it's about the land. You know, everybody's afraid we're gonna come back and take our land back, which would be the entire United States. So that's so ridiculous. But anyway, <laughs> um, mostly tribes want their historic towns, uh, areas that were important to them that they can return to. Uh, they're not after taking up all the land. Uh, they're after taking up the knowledge of the land and, uh, and maybe some stewardship, um, sharing some stewardship practices of the land uh, and that we believe are valuable to everyone right now. So anyway, I just wanted to add that. These, these kinds of goals, I think, really highlight the importance of, of the conversation that we're having today, right, about collaboration. Um, that, you know, the more of us that get together, uh, bringing our different skill sets, bringing our different networks together, you know, we can really further this mission um, and, and support and encourage more interest, greater collaboration, and more concern for resources that may potentially be threatened. Um, we are coming up on time. In fact, we've gone just a little bit over. So for those participants who have asked questions um, that we didn't get to visit here in the last chapter, um, we'll try to answer those in the emails that were in, email addresses that were included with your registration. I uh, very much on behalf of, of all of us like to thank our distinguished panelists um, and Preservation Virginia for hosting this excellent panel and including us DHR's partners. Uh, we very much look forward to the next conversation and pass it back to Elizabeth and Senya. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to all of our uh, panelists today. I think it's been an inspiring discussion. Um, I think we're all, you've challenged us all to think a little harder, um, to, to act more intentionally and be open to examine 
a shared approach to exploring our history. Um, I do want to note that November marks National Native American History Month, and there are activities and events around the state that I hope you'll find that you can participate in. But I think our uh, participants today, our panelists, have really challenged us to something that should be year round. And that is that, and I'm going to borrow from some of their words, um, to dedicate ourselves to becoming accomplices with the descendant of, um, descendants of Native American and African American communities, to break down the barriers to ensure inclusivity, to share in the stewardship of the land and the history, and to build relationships to discover, preserve, and share the many layers of the stories that make Virginia's history and historic places. So thank you to you all. I hope everyone will join us on our next webinar. Um, and in the meantime, this a recording of this presentation will be posted to our website so you can go back and um, share it with others. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody.